part of me wished I spent 10,000 hours learning to play the guitar instead of learning computer animation. But anyway, here we go. Carbon dioxide, infrared, or IR activity. You need to learn these three stretching and bending motions that the carbon dioxide molecule can do. If the molecule just happens to be making one of these motions as it's hit by an infrared photon, then one of two things can happen. If it's infrared inactive, like the one on the left, then the photon will just pass straight through. But if it is infrared active, the motion, then the infrared photon will be absorbed and then re-radiated by the carbon dioxide molecule. It is, of course, re-radiated in a random direction, but I've shown them being re-radiated back down. So you can see the carbon dioxide is acting like some kind of mirror. It's reflecting back the infrared or the heat, electromagnetic radiation from the Earth, which would be at the bottom in this diagram. So how can you tell if a motion is infrared active or infrared inactive? Well, the long and short of it is, if the motion causes the dipole to change, then it is infrared active. So for carbon dioxide, they're going to want to know which of these is infrared inactive, I'd imagine. And that's the symmetrical stretching. The dipole of the carbon dioxide doesn't change when it undergoes symmetrical stretching. All of the main three water motions for the molecule, asymmetrical stretching, symmetrical stretching, and symmetrical bending, all of these involve a change in dipole for the molecule. And so that means all of these motions are infrared active. And so infrared light from the Earth will be absorbed and then re-radiated, potentially back down again, to the planet, thus keeping us warm. And so this is how the two molecules behave as greenhouse gases. You don't need to know how methane, the other molecule mentioned in the syllabus, actually behaves like a greenhouse gas in this detail.